Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take-Up. Today we have episode 156, Constructive Stitches, Underlay, Travel, Tacking, and Ties. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into The Take-Up on this wonderful Education Friday. Uh, wherever you are, whatever time it is, I'm happy to have you here with me today to talk about the stitches that we don't see but keep putting in the work, the stitches that stabilize, the stitches that support our top stitching, the stitches that aren't perhaps given all the glory, but do all that grunt work, making sure that our embroidery is stable, that our coverage is complete, that our garments don't move around and their applique stays put. So this is not something that should be a super long topic, but believe it or not, I still get questions daily. And I do mean daily about things like, why do we need underlay at all? Is underlay functional? What does it do? Um, what sorts of stitching do we need to put together in order to have applique correctly work? What sort of stitching is put together to make a patch base work? Which, by the way, in small run embroidered edge patches is very, very similar to an applique and quite, quite truthfully, is often made with an applique tool, depending on what uh, sort of software you're using. And in the case that it's something that you're concerned about, maybe you've got some issues with stitching, whether this is 3D foam specific stitching, whether it's tack downs, whether it's ties, whatever it is that you have concerns about, by all means, I would love for you to jump in the comments today and ask your questions, share your insights, and we'll see if we can get you on air, if you want to call it that, on broadcast, on live with me, on stream and we can talk about it. But I'm just going to talk a little bit today about those stitches, about the stitches that are underlying everything we do, and not just underlay, but everything that's related. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to a little bit of all of that. We can talk about things like knockdown, which is, uh, by the way, a trademark that's actually only in, in Brilliance, but also nap tacking stitches, whatever people call it, lay down and knock down. I used to call mine the light mesh fill. Um, it has since been something that's very similar now, added to software automatically as the bi-directional knockdown stitch, trademark. <laughs> but these are all sorts of stitches that are used for support, that are used for different reasons in order to, like I said, provide stability, to provide color coverage, to provide structure. So yes, some of this is, is old news to a lot of you folks, but it's stuff we can talk about. I think it's something that's worthwhile to think about. And in all honesty, if I can do a shorter show today where we just kind of covered that stuff, that's great. Always, as we're going through this, if we have questions, if you want to share something, if there's something you want to talk about on the nature of those stitches that we need in order to make things work, not just the stitches that are on top, feel free to ask. But hey, if you've got other questions that are interesting, especially as we get toward the end of the show, dump them in. You never know. We might as well go for it. Sometimes I like to do Q&A while we're doing this too. I haven't done a proper office hours in some time and it's probably time to do that again too. But like I can say, as I showed you in the earlier channel cap here, what we've got for our, our thumbnail, um, it's all sorts of constructive stitches that we don't think about. There's the way we travel too. So it's traveling from item to item. It's uh, how we tack things down, how we attach, how we use underlay that I think it's way more related to our Success. Success in embroidery, good looking embroidery, uh, flat presentations are more reliant on these stitches than you think they are. And it also has to do with things like sequencing and pathing and the way in which it designs stitches. Remember, if we're thinking about embroidery designs in a way that is sensible, that we can use to predict the way they're going to turn out, one of the things we have to be cognizant of is the order in which things lay down. Remember that we have a sequence in time. So we have first stitch to last stitch. We have layers as we're building from first stitch to last stitch. As we go over top of existing layers, we are building, stacking, stacking. So we are building layers up. So we have sequence in time. We have layers that are building. And there's interactions between stitches laying in different directions that are of different heights and lengths and that have different support systems and different underlay systems involved. And the only way to really understand all of that is to think about it through time, in layers, and the last part of this, and that has to do with pathing, is the direction of apparent motion in the design. And I know that's gonna sound stupid, apparent motion. I'll just say it again, exactly what I mean by that. Very obviously, especially when we're looking at software, we're replaying a design. The thing that we're watching, the design stays put and it looks like we're watching the needle moving. That's the apparent motion, the way it looks like it moves, especially to a digitizer who's watching a slow replay. However, we all know that the real motion brain machine has the hoop move, not the needle. But at the same time, that same interaction of where that presser foot's heading as we are stitching through a design 
it is pushing material, it is causing distortion, it is causing rippling and things are moving in the hoop. So we should understand that it's not just where things stack, how dense they are, how different stitch angles interact. It's what direction we are moving, what we're moving towards, what we're moving away from that helps with all of the textural issues, the rippling, the puckering, the kinds of things that can happen with light materials if we don't take care of that stuff. We can get distortion that's not just about the number of stitches or how close together they are, but is about the way we move. So all of that kind of gets taken into consideration. However, one of the things to remember about that is that we also then get to look at what supportive stitches we can add, how we can use our stitching to tack down fabrics, and to prepare the field for embroidery, right? Knockdown makes it really clear. We're knocking down pile, we're laying down fibers, we're putting together a solid base of thread on which we can place our designs. So a lot of underlay, a lot of things like knockdown, supportive global underlays like that. And we'll probably talk a little bit about more about that as well. Uh, they really have to do with preparing the garment for embroidery. Also, we have to remember, like I say over and over again, the uh, embroidery machine is a glorified sewing machine. It is an interlock machine that sends that needle down and we wrap the thread around. And in the end, we've got two loops kind of pulling at each other at every stitch intersection of bobbin thread on one side and uh, top, top thread, sewing thread on the top, embroidery thread on the top. And as we have that, they're pulling on each other. What we have to remember, we're sewing our stuff together. It's the same as creating a seam on a sewing machine, meaning that things like underlay and constructive stitching are also sewing our fabric down to our stabilizer. And here we go again with me just over explaining, but I'm just going to go for it. Once again, what does underlay do for us? And part of that is also securing our fabric, our workpiece to our stabilizer. The stabilizer is dimensionally stable, meaning it doesn't stretch in any given direction too much. It doesn't move, doesn't slip. When we sew our stretchy, loose, light fabrics down to it before we start putting the heavier density, the close penetration points and the motion, the apparent motion and stresses of the top stitching into our design, we can already enable or impart the strength, the stability of our stabilizer to that top fabric by stitching them together. And we do the same thing by using adhesives, uh, by using sticky stabilizer, by using fusible stabilizers or webbings to stick stuff down before we stitch. But the thing is, we can also do that with a good old thread and needle, just the way we would if we were trying to sew something together. We all talk, also will talk a little bit about like things like patch attachment and applique. Very similar. What are we doing? I mean, ultimately, <laughs> we're running a sewing machine with a robot. Our friendly embroidery robot moves a hoop underneath our sewing machine so that we can place stitches exactly where they want them. But the great thing is that means we can do the things that sewing does with embroidery and it helps us to provide stability. So we've got a lot of comments jumped in. So while we guys have you here, I know you're on hashtag replay squad. You're coming in late. Hey, that's awesome. Still love to have your comments, but as you know, feel free to skip this. If you're on replay squad, you don't want to hear me say hi to everybody, but for those who are here live every Friday, you're going to hear the highs and you're going to hear the greetings. All right. So let's say hi to some folks who are here in the chat right now who are in the comments. We've got Barb saying, good afternoon from sunny north central Minnesota. Good afternoon from Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's where I'm at if you didn't know. Uh, Marta from Calvary Creations says, hello from Texas. Awesome. We got Scott from Sunrise Tactical Gear. Thank you for putting your name in there. That's awesome. Uh, happy Friday from sunny central Washington State. Glad to hear where everybody's coming from. We have Frank coming in directly from the UK across the pond. Awesome sharer, contributor, and runner of groups. Thank you very much. Got people saying hi to each other, which I love, right? Love it, love it. Uh, sugar dough. So sugar, I guess, if you don't mind. I'll be informal. Hello, Eric from England. Happy to see you here as well. Uh, Lisa's coming in from the rain and hail in Colorado. Love the back to basics episodes. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it's, it's hard not to do these once in a while. It, those of us who've been doing this for a long time, remember, uh, I was a full-time digitizer late 99, early 2000. I was a commercial digitizer at that point. I've been doing this a long time. I've been talking about underlay for a long time. So sometimes I feel like I shouldn't repeat it. But what I keep hearing from people who uh, come to the shows and who come to these episodes as well is that, hey, you they're coming in from a different perspective. Or maybe you never thought of all the stuff that I said. Somebody said, put underlay. You put underlay, but you didn't think about why you should place underlay where it is. 
And by the way, put underlay, you can tell that I'm from New Mexico. I'm coming out with the New Mexico isms right now. Put, put the underlay. Uh, but yeah, why did we add underlay to the stack? Why do we stitch stuff together? Hey, stability and edge retention, everything else. I'm actually going to go over that. I'll go over the points for that. But yeah, back to basics episodes, sometimes what we need to do. Um, love to do more artistic stuff. Tell me what you want to know about digitizing. Tell me what you want to see me work on. We'll talk about it. Like I said, I am here for you guys. So if you give me clues about what you need, that's what I'm going to answer. Why am I doing this today? Um, another field of questions about underlay and, quite frankly, uh, stepping into some conversations where there was a, a lot of misinformation about underlay stitching. Now, it's not how it used to be where the reason I used to complain about underlay or have to talk about it was that people were accusing commercial embroiderers or commercial digitizers, people who charge by stitch count, by thousand stitches, of using underlay to pad uh, their stitch counts to make things more expensive. I got accused of that because I wouldn't tear underlay out of a design on a textured garment at a one point in my career. And honestly, hey, it is absolutely not about padding things. And in fact, here's the magical trick I'm going to tell you about underlay. If you use the correct underlay, you can reduce the density of your top stitching and the overall stitch count is often less. Wow, add stitches to lose stitches. I know it sounds crazy, but remember, underlay is providing a foundation and coverage. So if we're providing a foundation and coverage, well, let's say I have stitches going this direction and I want, need to cover, but they're a little further spaced apart. Well, if I have stitches underneath them going this direction, even if I have fewer of them, they're nice long stitches. Well, I'm providing color coverage, aren't I? And I know I talk with my hands a lot and cause the white balance on the camera to go nuts, but we're going to keep that up. Trust me. Talking to my hands is going to be a lot today. That's absolutely the truth. Uh, it's something that we need to think about because honestly, uh, underlay is not just that. And that's the thing. We think about it as a color coverage thing. We're like, I need to color do some color coverage. Yeah, there's that. But like I said, edge reinforcement, and this is not the last time you'll hear me say that, we have a nice satin stitch and our edges might be kind of fringy because we're on something that's textured or has some pits like the K-Polo or something with a basket weave. Well, I've got a nice underlay rail under it. My satin stitch now likes to hold on to something. It has a rail to attach to and my edges look better. And, and I'll just go ahead and do the thing that I always show you guys. I do the, the hand satin stitch once again. So here's my satin stitch. If it's on a curve, well, the outside of the curve is going to be less dense than the inside of the curve. If I have an edge run underlay under here, provides color coverage as well as that rail to grab onto. The underlay has a job to do. That's why we don't just tear it out. And I know we've done an underlay episode recently. I'm not just going to talk underlay the whole time. But at the same time, it is something to remember that these stitches have a job. That's something actually Lisa says a lot. The stitches have a job to do. The tools have a job to do. And in this case, I'll go back to what I always say. Think of embroidery like we are standing on the plane. Here is our plane of our embroidery. Here's the field on which... We are standing and that's our garment, our shirt, whatever it is, our fabric, and we are building our layers. We are putting down rails and we're setting upon those rails some planks and building our little boardwalk and that's our edge run underlay and that's our satin stitch. We are making a physical thing. The, the, if you think about the embroidery like you were an ant looking at it coming together, these are ropes that we are laying down and we are tying other ropes over the top of them. And suddenly tension starts to make more sense to you. Suddenly what the underlay is doing, the fact that it's a different direction from the top stitching. Well, of course, cause then this one can't pull through the other one. Otherwise, if they're the same direction, it can slip to one side or the other. Why is underlay offset an angle? That's why. Why when we have two fills that come together and they're slightly offset, they don't make a horrible fringy edge, but when they do together, they, they do come together at one angle. They make a fringy edge and pull more because they're physically blocking. That's the thing, underlay physically blocks. So like I said, we won't just talk underlay, but it will be a lot of underlay talk because it's just one of those things that it's not always considered, but once you start to think about it as the physical thing it really is, not as a setting, not as something somebody told you take on and put off, whatever. I've got some leather, letters look bad, right? I've got some letters that look rough on my hat and what does everybody start doing? Oh, it's the direction of sewing. I'm like, nah, the edge quality has no, no bearing on that. If it's rippling, then it's the edge of sewing. If it's if it's coming out of registration between one layer and another, one color to the next, that can be the direction of, of movement there. However, no, that's not edge quality. Edge quality, uh, density, underlay, needle selection, for real. That's one of those things. <laughs> that's one of those things. 
we need to think about the physical nature of the thing. Uh, why does your edge look rough? Well, uh, we've got some extra spacing in it. We need color coverage. It's hitting on different parts of the woven buckram behind the hat, which means we're causing needle deflection. We're using a ballpoint needle. And so the needle's hitting the woven buckram that's going to one side or the other of each of the rows of that buckram or that plastic support material, whatever support materials inside of that hat. And it's causing the needle to wander. So we get some jaggedness on our edges. How can we fix that? Well, sharps can help. Certainly stout needles that are sharp, uh, but underlay helps with color coverage and helps to lift things off the surface and provide an edge for things to grab onto, especially when there's texture. But the thing is, if you were thinking about the embroidery as if it were ropes sitting in front of you on your desk, so on the macro scale instead of the micro scale, you get yourself into that micro Ant-Man version of embroidery then you start to understand what's going on and you don't think about it as settings or lines on the screen. You think about it as these physical objects that we are placing and moving around, needles that are going through stacks of fabric, uh, thread that's under tension, that's pulling on that fabric and that's interacting with the other stitches, the other ropes that you're laying on top of them or near them. The physicality of embroidery once grasped absolutely leads you to the right answers for what's going on in digitizing and what's going on with materials. 100%. If you can grasp the physicality of embroidery on the micro scale, you can make designs work on the macro scale. It's just how it is. Um, and I think that's a lot of what's good about being an operator first. We have a couple more comments before we get done here. So uh, yeah, we've got everybody hanging out, which I love. Uh, Stephanie says, yeah, love learning behind the scenes. Yeah, the behind the scenes stuff is what you need to know because honestly, it, it is so much of how things work. Your, your house will fall apart if foundation is bad. And the same thing with your embroidery. Your embroidery can fall apart if your underlay is poor. And hey, are there, in, in, are there certain kinds of ways we can work? Are there situations in which underlay is not necessary? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's when it's necessary and we don't use it correctly that it's not great. And also there's just things we can mitigate. You can mitigate them different ways. But uh, underlays one of those ways. But what I love too is Lisa, I agree. She says, Frank, feel like we're at a copy house for a weekly meetup. I love that. I love being part of that, folks. Glad to do that. And hello, Joe Rita. <laughs> Happy to have you in. And AJ Embroidery and Apparel from Gold Coast. Uh, Saturday morning education with Eric. Hi, everyone. Hope all is well. Uh, reaching out for Australia. Gold Coast. Happy to have you in as well. Gold Coast. Know some good folks out there. And yeah. Here's just, there's some different stuff going on here, <laughs> but you know, I, I will answer questions as well. And actually <laughs> like Lisa says, sharing a Pepsi as we listen to Eric reveal his secrets. Love it. Love it. Uh, Jorita has a question before we get into the meat of the thing. I'm actually going to answer the question first because it's a fairly easy one. Um, Jorita says, how can you make your underlay the same color as the fabric? A uh, couple different ways we can go about this in digitizing software, and it depends on what kind of underlay we're dealing with. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, um, manual versus not. First thing I'm going to say is uh, it depends on what you want to do. If you're trying to provide color coverage, I don't think you ever would want to have it the same color as the fabric. But let's say we're doing something like, uh, well, like we're doing a global underlay or there's some reason. Let's just imagine the reason. We want the reason with the underlay to be the same color, the color of the fabric. doesn't matter why. Two things we can do. If we are really tied to using the automatic settings, um, probably the only option we have there is to go into our final stitch file. If your software has, and it probably should, a stitch editing uh, mode of some sort. If you're in Brilliance, it means you've got Enthusiast. If you're, or, or actually you can do this in Essentials as well. Or if you're in any other stitch editing software that happens to allow you to drop color stops, then what you can do is literally manually play through the underlay until we get to the end of the underlay. We're gonna have to block it into a color stop and then sort the colors. Um, that's not the best way, but if you're someone who's using automated underlay, um, software doesn't generate underlay as a separate color object just about ever. Uh, the other thing is you make your underlay manually. If we look at underlay types, and actually I'm going to bring up some underlay types and just talk about them really quickly. Um, yes, we have automated underlay. The thing is automated underlay doesn't have to be automated. Um, and I'll, I'll like, we'll talk about this in a second. I think it's worthwhile to give this kind of a, a little bit of discussion. So let me, let me go ahead and add something to the stream here. Let's go through some of the stuff we have here. I've got different examples of underlays that we might do. And in fact, here's one where you might want the same color in this, perhaps, is doing a shape underlay like this, uh, where we're actually just tacking down the material. In this case, we can't do a mesh or a particular, like a star shape, which is what I might usually do. And I can show you guys what I mean by that in a second. 
you might do this in the same color uh, if you absolutely had to. Here's a star underlay that's made just to tack down uh, fabric. And unfortunately, you're seeing some ghosts of my cursor. I don't know why uh, StreamYard's doing that, but you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, this was done just to tack down material before we start doing this heavy stitching. Uh, in the case of this particular design, I'm just going to explain it. Um, this hole that was here for the fitness bar was puckering and looking poor and we were having some shifting while I was working on the piece. Even though this is a big slab and you would imagine, wouldn't imagine that it would cause any shifting, uh, we were having some shifting because we were leaving a big hole for this fill and it turned out that just tacking it down with the star shape, actually I started down the bottom up into the center out to each of the extremes with my underlay that I digitized manually and then uh, did the rest of the work from the bottom to the top in the fill. And there's my cloud of cursors there. Um, in doing that, we stabilize the material by stitching it down to the much more stable uh, backing material. The material that was being done for this fitness client was, of course, a sport mesh. So we're talking about a polyester uh, kind of wicking material that was very light, very slippery in the hoop. We hoop some nice... Uh, performance material or some performance uh, stabilizer. And then we stitched that down with that underlay before we ran out. Uh, in this case, it was created manually. And like I said, we'll talk about different types of underlay, but let's let's just go. Like, let's say we have a couple of these underlays here. Uh, this is a standard edge run underlay. The thing is, what's important that makes this underlay rather than anything else? Uh, nothing. This is a straight stitch. And if you had to add underlay manually, you can. Uh, and in fact, if you wanted it to be the same color for some reason as the material, the way to handle that would be to digitize this as a straight stitch. Does it mean drawing? Yeah, it means drawing in some fashion. You could also just literally, um, if you had a border that was describing the outside edge of this and you had something like an inset tool or any manner of border tools that would allow you to inset, compress, or otherwise make a contour of that shape, you could just make a contour because as you can see, it essentially is very much like a box that is in the center of this. I apologize for the weird cloud of cursors thing that StreamYard is doing now where when we show the cursor, it's jumping all over the place. But we can still kind of see if I trace this for you that this underlay, if we were moving the stitches from left to right, this underlay would start here in the corner, run out to the edge, dip in at the ends, go back down to this corner, back over and to the origin point, then it would jump out and we would start stitching our top stitching on top of that. Um, if we think about it that way, it is essentially just a set of straight stitches. We can add manual underlay to anything we want to. This edge run underlay is just straight stitches. And quite frankly, there are many times, especially in the case of very small text, that I will draw manual underlay with the straight stitch tool instead of using any sort of automation, especially because sometimes I want to underlay an entire letter or to some degree, I've actually underlaid entire words before coming back and stitching the top stitching. It does mean travel. Sometimes the travel stitching that's inside each letter might be making that underlay thicker. We have to watch about how many times we pass under any particular uh, satin stitch, especially with something really thin. Uh, if you have really thin, small lettering, the more passes of underlay you do, you can build up something thicker than the actual lettering itself and end up with stitches flying out of the outside edges. Or if we don't uh, make this inset value, how far away we are from the edges deep enough, it can come out and pop out as the uh, stitches pull tight. Or if we end up where um, under tension, the column is actually narrower than the edge that we put in, uh, we have to increase that inset. Um, but the thing is, underlay stitches are just a conglomeration of other stitches we already have. If we look at this, this is a, a, what's often called a contour plus double zigzag, edge, edge run plus double zigzag, or you'll have this as uh, diagonals plus contour. It really depends on your software. But what are we seeing here in reality? Um, in reality, this is a straight stitch box. We're doing our edge run, right? It might dip in at the end. Some of them dip in at the end, some don't. So we have this straight stitch box that's inset from the edges. We have a zigzag that goes just outside the edges out to one side. And then we jump back and zigzag back up to the origin point again so we can start doing our satin stitch. You can make any underlay you want. Underlays are, are just simply the, the stitching that we place underneath the top stitching that has a job to do. And I think that's why that's what makes it different from travel. Um, traveling stitches are underneath the, the stitching that are on top, that's on top, it's underneath the top stitching, but it is literally made just to travel from one place to the next. Can you do this with underlay? Absolutely, you can. Um, it can be supportive. Travel stitching can be used to make supportive elements that hold up the stitching, that add uh, height to the stitching. But 
when I'm talking about underlay, usually I'm trying to achieve something with it. Otherwise it really wouldn't be there. You know, underlay stitching generally has a job to do that's more than just traveling. Hey, traveling is a job. Moving from one object to the next without jumping and trimming for efficiency. That is a job. It's a real job that needs to get done. However, it is something where if I took it out, right? If you took a travel stitch out um, and decided to jump and trim everything, yes, you lose a bunch of time and now you're risking, you know, thread tails and pulling out and all the rest of it. But if you take it out, it doesn't adversely affect the, the design in any way, shape, or form. If you take out underlay, you're removing color coverage, structure, edge reinforcement, and the rest. So that's the difference between like underlay and travel stitching. And I want to talk more about travel. Travel has a great job to do. And we'll talk about why you might do different kinds of travel stitching. Um, mostly travel stitching is just going to be straight stitching that happens in between objects, just straight running stitches between objects. That's generally all a travel stitch is going to be. Uh, how we hide them and why we use them in certain ways we can talk about, but travel stitching doesn't have the same kind of job. This thing has a job. And if we look at this again, just to make it clear, what is underlay stitch doing? If we look at any one of these little stitches, right? So let's say I'm looking at any one of these vertical stitches. If we count, as we go across here, we'll have this vertical stitch. It goes over the edge underlay, so that's one place it's supported. Then it goes over the first zigzag two. This one actually has a central run as part of it, a central traveling run. It may not always, so that's three, four, five. At five places, as this vertical satin stitch is running, and generally really wide satins are where we're gonna use something like this, at five places, this each one of these stitches is supported. So when we're looking at this, we can say, all right, what's it actually doing? What's the job? As it goes across here, we are supporting any stitch in five places, holding it up off of the surface of the garment underneath, and co creating color coverage. But to answer Jerry's question, how do you get them in the same color or in different color? Let's say you want to, for whatever reason, maybe even for a, a look, because you can do a light. The funny thing, for just for a interesting look, and I've done something very similar to this. Um, in fact, I did this to do speckling in some designs, and I've done this to add uh, just some interesting color, or I've used metallics sometimes in an under layer. You could do something in the under layer and lighten the top density with the intent to show that thread. So imagine we want little bitty sparkles inside of something, you know, inside of a piece, but we don't want lines of sparkling thread. Well, imagine making a grid underlay under a blue field and you use a metallic thread, but we use a light density blue fill on top. And now we have something that looks like water that's sparkling because we can allow just a little bit of the metallic to show through. Uh, shorter stitches on the metallic, longer stitches on the fill. There's lots of reasons to run stuff, but that's some that's some stuff that shows. That's maybe not underlay. That's just a textural layering, but it wouldn't be where we would want to have things uh, fill together and blend. It would be where we literally want to create uh, interference patterns where we just show little bits and pieces of what's underneath. But that's the thing. We just got to think about this thing physically. We start to think physically about how these are put together then it starts to make a lot more sense to us what, what's going on. And it also opens up all the possibilities to us. So yeah, Dorita, way we make a underlay in a different color from the rest, probably draw it yourself. It has to be in an object that you can assign color to separately. Uh, that's probably the best way. If you're dealing with an existing design and it has some sort of supportive underlay that's showing through in a way that you don't like and you want to make that a different color, what you would probably do is clay through toward the end of that underlay until it comes to a point where the top stitch is going to start drop in a color stop and then you can sort that as long as it's underneath the place where it's supposed to be you can just sort it back into the stack and make sure the colors make sense for you so yeah a lot of answers for a little question <laughs> and, and going off track but we know that's what's going to happen on the take up we're going to go a little far with anything we discuss right so let's talk about the different things we were going to talk about today right the different kinds of things constructive stitching why do i say constructive stitching as part of all of this uh because primarily most of the stuff we're talking about today is about structure. It's about adding something to it. Does it show to a degree? Yes, of course. Um, especially when we're talking about underlay doing color coverage, it shows, but it's not the primary decorative stitching on top. And there's also fully constructive stitching like that the uh, underlay I showed you, the star shape underlay or the other underlay that was made to tack down material. Those pieces are completely constructive stitching as are things like placement lines for applique, 
tack down stitches or cut lines if you're doing a hand cut style applique for whatever reason. Um, these things are all constructive stitching. And to a degree, I'd say same with uh, traveling. Travel stitching is constructive stitching in that it is there to provide a function in the construction of the design, but it is not intended to be primarily visible or part of the decoration. And like I said, I think that is something to consider that there is this whole kind of category of constructive stitching. And in fact, here's the thing I'm gonna tell you, when I talk about people digitizing and how much they wanna get into digitizing, many people are concerned that they're not going to be artistic enough, what have you. Whether or not you ever decide to do what I would consider uh, art interpretation as a digitizer. And hey, even down to the point of basic logo work, I still think everybody should know enough and have digitizing software or at the very least very capable editing software so that they can work on this kind of stitching, constructive stitching. Adding an underlay where there's too much show through, being able to travel between two objects instead of jump and trim when you have to. Uh, these things are worthwhile. Sometimes editing software can add things like running. Uh, we have a setting in Brilliance called run when jumps are small, where you literally just tell it, hey, if you encounter any jump stitch that's less than two millimeters, don't jump and trim that. Add, Go ahead and add me a little running stitch directly from point A to point B. The thing is, we don't always go from point A to point B. We need to sometimes travel under something else to get there. And in that case, you're going to need to draw a very simple line that just traces underneath a future element that's going to ride on top of it. And that is constructive stitching that I think you can learn. Anyone can learn to draw a simple set of lines in order to either add underlay to an object, to create travel stitching, to move from one section to another, even an existing design, because I think we can do, even we're sitting in the same, let's, let's say we're sitting in the same color segment on your design, the same color stop. And we have two objects, let's say they're, they're here and here, and later on in the sequence, something covers between these two objects, but for some reason our digitizer has decided between object A and object B, I'm just gonna jump and trim. Well, if there's a big satin stitch between these two, the far better choice for us would be to drop down and run some straight stitch between A and B. That way we don't jump, we don't trim, it's much faster, the machine keeps cycling, there's no chance for the thread to pull out, what have you. Even inside of the same color block where there's an existing jump, editing software will allow you to grab that piece, generate that last stitch, and then just start adding individual stitches manually, or we can add a color stop and break that into two objects and then come in with our digitizing software and say, all right, the end of this color stop, I want to start stitching here. And then I'm going to drop my line of stitching and literally I'm going to drop like three points, control point one, control point two, control point three that connects us to object B and then say, yep, I want that to be a straight stitch with a you know three millimeter run. And it's just going to put those stitches in for me. And I had to click three points. And now I potentially save, you know, 10 seconds every time that thing trims. Sounds like nothing, but over a course of a bunch of runs, it's something. Or let's say we're having trouble with our thread tails or pulling out, or it creates a trim line. If we're doing manual trimming that now when I run something across it, it looks weird or it gets tied up in something else that's going to run later. I could go and drop that little travel line and save myself a ton of trouble. So I think that constructive stitching, uh, whether it's adding underlay or dealing with travel is super useful to us. And it's something that everybody should learn. So a little bit of digitizing goes a long way for editing. And I know best thing, if you've got a digitizer who is consistently missing travel stitches or not doing what you asked them to do as far as handling that travel, you got a digitizer problem, not a digitizing problem. You probably need to talk to that digitizer and communicate or get another digitizer to do that job for you. Granted, I'm the one who always says, if you're editing constantly, you're on a design that you've paid someone to digitize, it's not great. Uh, they, people always come to me and say, oh, I've got this great digitizer I love. All I have to do, and then I hear the litany of things they do every time design comes in. All I have to do is come in, reset the trims, change the color sequence, add a couple of things here and there, they give me the original file, so it lets me change all the underlay and do this and that, and then it runs like a dream. I'm like, well, then you're the digitizer. Like, what are you, what are you paying for? I mean, that, admittedly, I say don't edit, especially if you're pulling around individual stitches all the time. Don't edit too much. But we all know that there may be a stock design, maybe a design that someone has had forever and they really love the look of it. But when we get it onto our machines, they bring this old logo design or old design they've been using forever. And it turns out it doesn't have good travel in it where it would really save us some time and trouble in order to 
fix that piece. If we would fix the piece before we ran it by adding a few stitches, by adding an underlay where it's uh, weedy or where the edges look bad, by adding travel where it's really inefficient, any of us should be able to do that. And I kind of champion that. That's that constructive stitching, constructive digitizing. It doesn't need to be hard. Uh, like I said, and I'll, I'll go ahead and put this back up on screen real quick. In all honesty, uh, things like this, dropping an edge run really doesn't take much to learn. And it's something that we can all do. Uh, point of fact, everybody say, all right, well, this seems like a lot of drawing. Well, of course not. Uh, tatami style, fill style underlay is just a smaller box behind this box. It's just a smaller version of the shape, a contoured in version of the shape that's inset. That is a fill stitch with a really, really broad, low density at, at, that is set on some angle that is uh, contrary to the angle of the top stitching. It's what it is. It's just another fill. This is a fill stitch. And also, quite frankly, it could be done with lines of straight stitching if you want to draw every line. There is no problem there. Um, a lot of what we do is just constructed. There is only one stitch. There is a single line from point to point is the only thing that our machines can make. And everything else is a conglomeration of stitches that are put together that way. It's about the automation we use to do it that makes them into stitch types the way we understand them. Those conglomerations can be created in any number of ways, including manually. If you are bloody minded enough and have the time, you can make anything you've ever seen with any software that there is. Now, if you would like the automation to work, that's a whole different <laughs> whole different uh, kettle of fish, is it not? If it doesn't always work the way you want it to. However, for constructive stitching, I think we can all do it. And like I said, underlay is one of the chief ones. We are gonna talk about travel, but I'm gonna very quickly just give you the spiel one more time about underlay, what, I, what it does, what it's here for for us. I just wanna make this one time clear again. Underlay has a job to do. These are the chief jobs that are very important to us color coverage, coverage in general, and this can also be related to texture control, but coverage, right? It covers area that's not being covered by top stitching, very obviously. Loft. People don't talk enough about loft. Dimensionality of our embroidery is one of the chief things that makes it attractive. Lifting the top stitches off of the base layer is achieved often by having that loft. We lay down something that we can then stitch the on top of. We lay down rails of underlay or zigzags. And in the case of things like what some people call the 3D satin, uh, that's a Wilcom term, but a 3D satin stitch is a little narrow satin stitch with a wider satin stitch with another wider satin stitch all run on top of each other. It's glorified underlay done dense and it builds up to be taller and taller because of that increasing amount of thread underneath the piece. We build up loft. Now, certainly you also build up loft using what I always have called the German underlay because it's it's like German lace work from the really from early days of like Shifley. Uh, but it is the edge run plus double zigzag, the contour plus double diagonals, whatever it is that your software calls it. Or if you build it yourself, you know, it's a contoured, uh, straight stitch with a couple of zigzags over it. That also produces more loft because it literally physically holds up the top stitching. When we provide more loft, we also get increased color coverage because it just literally makes a little air gap, lifts it off of the color underneath it. Uh, next thing we have edge reinforcement. I've already given you guys the hand satin stitch motif here where we are placing our little edge under our satin stitch. And if we have our curve and our loose densities that we get a little color coverage by putting our edge run underneath there. Edge reinforcement uh, also, like I said, brings that little bit of stability to when, where the edges start pulling in under tension, they have something to attach to. Uh, edge reinforcement is another reason for underlay. Texture control, because we can hold down textured materials, even with simple underlays like this, it doesn't always have to be full uh, knockdown, nap tack, or lay down types of stitching. Not, it doesn't always have to be the light mesh fill. And then of course, the other big one we ignore is stability of construction because we sew our material down to stabilizer. Why do I not say backing, right? I was giving you guys this speech before if you've been here a while, but why do I not say backing? Because I want you to remember that backing isn't just to be on the back. That's not its job. It is stabilizer. It is meant to stabilize the fabric and the stitches as they are being formed. And in fact, truthfully, even when I say topping, I, I should take my own advice on this one. I say, oh, water-soluble topping. It's not just there to be on top. Uh, it's It really is texture control. It's there to lift the stitches, make them more stable, at least in the fact that they won't sink in as much. And that provides you with some extra edge quality and it keeps things from sinking. It just literally puts a barrier, a physical barrier. 
remember that all of these things are under physics. We are working with real objects uh, under physics in the real world that are interacting with each other. And if we understand things in that physical way, it really does start to make sense of all these settings and things that we're working on. Like I said, stuff that we should think about. And I'm going to get into more things too, certainly, but let's, let's keep going. We got a couple of comments. Uh, Carol says sparkling water, mind blown. Yeah. Play with that. Light densities are different colors together. You can make some really interesting stuff. Also, uh, the one I always talk about is the, the little tiny flags of stars for those of you who are dealing with the U S or if you have a, uh, any sort of like an animal that has little teeny tiny speckles or spots on it, a grid on top of a color, as you can see the, uh, green screen behind me or see my face through this thing. Uh, obviously a grid with color behind it looks like a little set of little squares or spots in between where the grid falls together. Well, that little spot that's in there, if we make a full grid of fill on top of another color, we can actually provide little spots, little stars, whatever you want to call them, uh, that are going to show through of the base color. So yeah, that mesh can make some interesting things, or we can make patterns by having different kinds of interference between curved fills and things. Um, even though I am somebody who's died in the wool commercial and did a ton of logo work, you guys saw me, uh, if you were on one of the earlier episodes, scrolling through uh, one of my folders that had some 17,000 designs in it, and tons of it is just logo types, right? A bug, some sort of design with some text. There's a lot of that in my career. But even in that, um, those textural explorations let me show texture in things that you might not expect. So interesting textures can be had by doing that layering. Once again, remember physically what we're doing. Uh, it's easier to think that way. Uh, Lisa says, sometimes we forget that underlay can be created manually. We don't have to use the automation. I'm actually going to show you a version of underlay that I've never seen automated that I used a lot. Um, I like to have nice, big, wide satin-like stitches. So I will use what's considered a length limit stitch or an auto split satin. So it doesn't split on direct lines. It has uh, a, a bit of offset. So we get some offsetting and we don't end up with a really sharp defining line like a traditional split satin. But those tend to have some issues with show through. Uh, they tend to have some issues with support. And so I actually make my own contour underlays for that. And I'll show you that. The contour underlay is not the traditional contour on the outside edge. It's a contour fill underlay. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, manual underlays are tremendously useful. Also, because you can underlay between two objects. How many times have we seen the, and this is the classic one you actually have seen somebody do before, the T, right? We've got the T. So we've got our satin stitches here. And where these two meet for whatever reason, probably because these satin stitches are actually pulling in this direction, these are this way. Um, they pull apart, they break things up, right? So they all break in between because these guys are under tension and they're pulling these apart or because they just butt together. And for some reason, there's a gap here. Tons of people will throw a little underlay zigzag between the two. Well, you can't automate that except for in really particular conditions. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, because we have two objects and underlay is underneath each object. We have this bar on the top and we have the T on the bottom. We have that stem that's in the bottom. Well, that is achieved by manually drawing a little zigzag in between and then it provides some color coverage and keeps it from separating. Um, I tend to do some things with stitch angle to tip that in so they don't split apart. But if you have two items that are coming together in a design and there's just a little bitty gap, especially somebody else has created this design for you, that gap is only causing you problems on high contrast elements. You can actually break apart. You put a color stop between the original underlay and the final piece on that first stem. Let's say the stem is going up and then the T is finishing on the top break off that underlay when it gets up to the top, break it into two pieces, then manually drop a few stitches of zigzag that bridges the gap between those two columns and then let it continue on its merry way the way it did originally. And you can fix that design. You don't have to mess with it. You won't have to have it edited. Um, it's one of those things where you have one garment that's causing problems. You have some issues with nap on something, adding a knockdown stitch. If you've got enthusiasts, adding a nap tag, adding a different kind of underlay can save the day when you're on a weird garment or uh, when your design has one little flaw that really you don't want to redigitize for, or that would, that you really can't wait to redigitize for then little bits of constructive stitching can be quite, you know, quite obviously useful. But so we talked about underlay and what it covers. I mean, I don't think we necessarily need to go into a, a mass amount of detail about how this stuff works, you know, and what we're looking for. But I think it, it's worthwhile just to kind of 
say, you know, that's what that's what underlay is. That's what it does. Um, to to think about what underlay is rather than just say, okay, and, and like I said, what is it doing? And I'll show once again. This is my goofy little example. I'll show it one more time because I, I always show this. Sometimes I'm telling it myself because it doesn't actually look correct for building a plank. But hey, think of underlay like this, and you'll never think of it the same way again. We are trying to put a boardwalk on our little grassy, muddy field. Well, the grass is showing through. We see between the boards, but we don't have enough boards to cover. Eh, we put up on some rails, and now it's lifting up off of the grass. It's not so close to the mud, but we're still seeing a lot of stuff underneath there. But we have a few more planks, just not all of them that we want to go all the way across. Well, add a couple planks, and you'll see it's covering up some gaps. Now, is that realistic in how things are built? No. But if you think about your underlay like this, if you think about your top stitching like this, um, you'll start to see what I'm talking about, that essentially we're building a platform. In building that platform, we are physically blocking and lifting. We're blocking the fabric underneath. We're lifting the top stitching off. That's what we're trying to do. So underlay has a job. Now, the one thing this doesn't show is we need to inset. Otherwise, that those, as we can see, our, our, our little uh, rails here are going to show on the outside edge of this piece. But suffice it to say, um, underlay is doing a job physically. And if we think about it as a foundation, it'll make a lot more sense to us. So underlay is good. It has some things that are useful to think about. Um, certainly, the other kind of underlay is specialty, and I'm just going to bring this up very briefly. Uh, 3D foam underlay, and that's that's the thing. When we're looking at underlay for 3D foam, we often have a, a lot more um, structure to it. It is very custom. It's done manually in almost all cases. If you are using uh, in Brilliant Stitch Artist Level 2, we actually have a setting for satin stitch columns that will allow you to add uh, what are called planks, uh, either internally, we don't have the internal plank, we do have end, we have planks and end caps um, that are, can be added automatically. No other software that I know currently is doing that. Generally, they are done by digitizing them individually. Um, but what I will also say is my travel in satin stitches is done with these big manual zigzags. You could use a zigzag column, but I often just do it manually while I'm running through because it allows me to connect everything uh, logically. This piece is pretty complicated with all the planks and caps, but uh, and let me show you what those are. These are special kind of underlays that are made to cut foam or support foam where it cuts because of the density of the top stitching. Um, and, like, and here's my one place I ever take a stand on underlay. Don't use Edron underlay because you will get these little bumps on the side. I sometimes call them the little marching ants. Those bumps are not pieces of foam that are stuck uh, and that won't melt back with heat. Those are underlay stitches that have fallen off of the foam and are now sticking outside of the column. So I don't ever use edge run or contour underlay on foam. It's just not something I would do. But there are these specialty kinds of underlays. Um, planks, it is an underlay that goes between two columns at a junction so that when the top column comes down and stitches its final line here, um, it it can't fully, while it's cutting the foam, the foam can't fully come apart because it has thread that's tying it together and we don't get a deep divot right there. Um, low density groupings along manual zigzags. So that's one of those times we, we absolutely do some manual work here and it's between two objects, like I said earlier. And think about it. We're just literally trying not to let the foam come apart. The two blocks of foam that have been cut by that deep uh, penetration that's happening with that high density top stitching, it can't come apart if there's something that's tying it together. They're being stitched together and where the, the satin stitches might want to fall into that crack when that foam starts coming apart, uh, instead of allowing, uh, and I'll go ahead and make myself a little bigger here so you can see me talk with my hands. Um, as those blocks of foam, if they now that they're cut, if they start to fall apart, satin stitches can track down into that piece, into that cut, and they will make a, a nice divot in it, which not everybody likes to look. They want a smoother look over the cross of the uh, columns in the letter. And so the stitching holds those two things together and provides a little bridge so that the top stitching has that little bridge that it's sitting on top of that it can't fall through. Um, it's super physical. It's logical. If we think about it like we're building something, uh, we'll understand it very well. So underlay planks, uh, in-column planks, if you have to leave in the center of a column, like we're coming from one side and then we're going to come back from the other side and have to exit a column in the center of it, a satin stitch column, then we may put an in-column plank like this. And this is actually to hold down foam. If we think about foam, it is a physical springy object. It's foam. We know that. So foam, sometimes when we come from one side and then try and come back from the other side with our satin stitches, where they come together, the foam is being pressed and pushed and the foam wants to pop up. We get a little nodule of foam that's in between and it won't cover. Um, putting an in-column plank 
literally takes that little piece of foam that wants to pop up and it holds it down so that we can run our top stitching over in the over top of that gap. So once again, even though the two column stitches are going to meet, the two satins are going to meet, because we have pushed from one side and toward the other, we can sometimes have a little bit of foam that wants to stick up from the middle. And that little foam that wants to stick up in the middle, we just tap it down, put our top stitching on top. So that's what that in column plank is about. Once again, it's all physical. It's all physical. It's the nature of the thing that we're working with. It's the physical nature of the materials. So same thing caps, what are caps? Those are not exactly under there. They are partially underlay. Uh, the thing to think about with them is it's more about cutting. We have to have a high density edge uh, that sticks out of each satin stitch column so that we are cutting with that high density edge. But on the inside of that edge, I like to use some jaggedness. Why do we use jaggedness on the inside of the edge? Uh, in order to prevent it from cutting on the inside so we don't get a divot that makes everything sink and that the foam cap, sometimes if you really do a nice sharp border on both sides, I've actually seen this many times doing 3D foam. Somebody will do a nice sharp satin stitch and it's the same density on both sides, same lineup, same perforations, and the entire cap, you'll have this satin stitch right here and the entire cap will pop out. It'll like fall out of the piece and you'll see the entire foam piece just kind of eject itself because this, this satin stitch is pulling on it and it's already split from that uh, underneath the cap that's underneath it and it'll just tip out, it'll move. Um, Instead of doing that, you have a jagged line on the inside edge. Why? We're perforating the foam with the needle as we stitch. We don't want to perforate the foam cleanly on the inside edge so it doesn't break off, so it doesn't cut. It's all very physical. And so thinking about that helps. So there's settings. We don't need to go over that. Uh, it helps with the waterfall effect. But yeah, points are another thing when you're doing a piece like this piece that I did for Madeira. If you have a nice little tapered point, but it's still not cutting the foam off, you can make these little arrowhead shapes. What's the real thing that we're doing here? We're making sure we have a high density piece. If we look at how high this density is here, and then it stops right here and the little foam peak, peaks out, instead of constantly having to jab that foam in and rip it off, we can do this little jagged underlay. But if you look at how the lines line up, and you can see my poor cursor as it keeps repeating itself, each one of these points um, ends up at a density that's similar to the outside cut edge, and that we end up just making a little perforation so the foam cuts off. And as we know, because the uh, satin stitches are going to continue traveling in this direction, they're gonna cover up that point that we use to cut it off. So like I said, it's these, these stitches that do a work. They're doing a job. It's specialty work, certainly, but they're doing a job. Uh, corner covers is another one like that, where it's really a physical thing. Let's say we have a baseball font that has a little sharp point at each one of these spurs that's on the side of the font. Imagine this as being a very famous C. And we see how we've got this foam that's sticking out of here. A corner cover is a little zigzag that you put in the underlay section. And when we use that underlay zigzag, we stop and do a little zigzag before we run. What does it do? Well, it just holds down this foam. It holds down this little piece of foam so that when I do my top stitching, this little sharp piece of foam that cuts off when we get our full density doesn't make a little wedge that pops out between the stitches. It doesn't spread the stitches out. Why doesn't it? Well, because it's being held down. We're thinking about the real forces and the physical objects that are there, and it makes some sense. So yeah, underlay has a job. And in foam, the things that I've showed you, those have a job too. Uh, the regular underlay we would use to shore up edges and stuff doesn't really have a job because foam has incredible densities of the top stitching. Uh, and those, some people will try and use it to cut. We're going to cut with the final density of the top stitching. So generally, we're not going to use underlay on satin stitches on foam. Not edge run underlay or traditional zigzag though we would use zigzags to travel. I use zigzags to travel just because if I have a nice block of foam and I start traveling down the middle, I'm actually gonna sink that foam in a little bit. I'm gonna cause a divot by stitching that foam down. And I want as much of that middle to be open and free to push up because foam being 3D is the whole point. So I don't like to squish it when we don't have to. I don't squish foam if I don't have to. So big zigzags are for that. But like I said, those are, those are other things that we do. Those are other reasons to use things. But that's not the only kind of stitching we have that's underneath stuff, right? What are the other kinds of constructive stitching we have? Certainly. Yes, we have underlay. We have global underlays like knockdowns or snap tacks, or like I showed you earlier, the star or shape fills. And I'll show you what we're doing for like a patch attachment, which also may include a global underlay. We have the foam specific underlays like caps and planks and bridges and points and corner covers. Uh, we have we have different ways that we're using them to be supportive and dimensional and all of those things. So certainly we talk about that, but we have foam specific underlays. The other thing we have is travel. So we have travel, we have tacking, so things that we need for applique. And then I would say we have connectors. I mean, trims are also there, trim points, but it's really ties. 
but those are just kind of the end point. It's just us making a small knot that won't pull out when we're trimming. That's really all we're doing with trims. There's different kinds of them, but most of them are just making a small series of stitches because real short stitches tend not to want to pull out. We know even if you try to make uh, short stitches on purpose and then have to pull them out, you know they don't like to come apart. But that's the thing. A lot of these other things, the tacking down, the placement lines, and, and hey, certainly placement stitches for patches or for applique just are there to give us a clean idea of where things are supposed to be placed. They should be just inside the edge of whatever cut piece we're wanting to put down or what we're eventually going to cut. And then there's things that are literally taken away, basting stitches. And that's another thing we don't think about as a type of stitches, but hey, big, long, straight or manual stitches that are used around the area of a design or around the area of the entire hoop to physically sew stuff down in a, such a way that we can take them out. Um, certainly what I would like to do, mostly I will use underlay for basting, but if we sometimes have materials where we can't hoop them for whatever reason, but we can lay them on the top. If there's stuff like that, uh, sometimes a very long basting stitch, if it's not a fabric that shows holes too much or it can be steamed to kind of remove the holes from the basting, we can stitch it down before we uh, before we start running. Once again, we're adding stability. We're doing the same thing that underlay does in general. We are basting. And if you think about uh, underlay as internal basting stitches, you're not wrong. It's just stitches that stay there and have some other jobs to do. Uh, stability on underlay can be that kind of way. And like I said, placement stitches are just there to be there. Um, attachment stitches, the other visible stitches, we can sometimes use stitches to attach something that we intend to be visible, whether we are attaching patches or we're attaching um, or attaching appliques of any sort. Because sometimes you could say, uh, though we can say, oh, those are usually satin stitches, so they have a, a some sort of cover quality. Some people will do zigzag appliques, and zigzag appliques really, though they provide a texture, their primary job is really attachment and keeping the edges flat because they don't really cover the entirety of the edge or provide um, any sort of trapping of loose fibers or anything, not nearly to the, the, rate, the extent of a fully dense satin stitch. But let's go ahead and talk about a couple of those things too. Like I said, different stuff we can discuss, but yeah, it's it's really, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Oh, and Lisa says, I've seen some long basting stitches done on 3D foam cap designs, light bulb. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Long internal basting can be done too. Yeah, and also I've seen them done that way to hold down things. But yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, AJ says, wicked. Hey, glad to hear that. <laughs> glad to hear that. Glad you like it. I thought of this as a topic that a lot of you are going to consider boring, but for me, every part of this is interesting to me. Plus, I'm going to show you some interesting stuff. I've got some samples up. So, you know, let's get into some samples and talk about them. Um, certainly, I think there's some things about travel. And I'll show you a very specific travel piece and a couple of different pieces that had some very interesting reasons why I traveled the way I did, just to show you what I mean by travel stitching. So let's bring up some software. Why not? We'll do that and be that, have this be kind of our, our finish to this is showing some stuff, replay and software. Hopefully, uh, if, if StreamYard will behave, and I don't have too much trouble with StreamYard from here on out causing copies and weirdness as we, uh, as we play through this stuff, I'll show you. But this was a logo for Isleta Casino. I've taken the rest of the logo type out and just left the initial shield. And here's the thing that I'm going to tell you about this. First, I did some textural stuff that I like the look of. If we look at this piece, it's got... Uh, it's a little too dense, perhaps. It's got a little too much fill behind it, but it was usually on pretty heavy jackets that had some texture to them. However, you'll see these lovely satin stitches here. These satin stitches that are done for the individual feathers, when you're looking at this design, it's awesome because every single one of them has a different angle, so the light really goes around. It's almost like brushed metal. As you can imagine, we have that swirl. We have that circular pattern of the stitches. And so when the light plays across them, they give this very nice reflection, right? They really do give you a nice shine. And this is a fairly small design. You know, it's not tiny, tiny, but it's fairly small. Um, if we look at the overall size of the piece, you can kind of see uh, what we're working with here. Um, we can actually say selective. We got, what, 51 mils. So, you know, we're at two inches. So it's fairly small, not tiny, but fairly small. Uh, when we have all these satin stitches that we're running, if you do the normal connection that people would expect, right? They would say, all right, where's the place where each one of these yellow satins meets and is easy to connect at? It's down here at the bottom. It's at the bottom of each of these satin columns toward the internal portion. But as you know, if we're running a satin stitch, if we're running it toward the middle and we do that over and over and over again, we're pushing material. We're pushing fabric. Well, it turns out that it was causing distortion. I tried to connect them all in the middle that way and found that it was causing this distortion that's going toward the middle. 
So what I decided to do, because I still loved the way that they looked, is on this particular piece, because we were seeing distortion and shifting, especially when we did this on some lighter materials as well, which I had to do some work to lighten it up, um, on lighter materials and shirts, it was absolutely causing a horrible amount of distortion. Also, because we had um, these layers where we had to kind of run these things in order, I probably could have run uh, the initial white ahead of time, um, but I ended up running... I did run the initial white first. I didn't run all of it. Some of the white was done later. I could probably could have played with that a little bit, but I was trying to do some carving with the satin stitches. And we have this big open ring, which you're going to see in a second, of this of this teal that goes down. We end up with some issues with the way it was put together. And I'll say also in the final piece, you'll see um, the fill, though it is underneath all these satins, where we get to a point that the satins are completely overlapped, the uh, teal fill does cut out. Uh, it is cut out of that center. There's a gap, but that also means there's a gap in the initial run. It means we're getting some, some kind of texture. We're getting some wrinkles. We're getting material that wants to pucker up in the middle. I ended up wanting to run them all toward the outside edge. So what you're going to see is this final satin stitch was put on secondarily after the rest of the design. Why do we do that? Well, because I was hiding travel. So let's look at this really weird version of travel. It's not something you do for everything, but it's something that worked for me physically dealing with this particular problem. So the first thing you're gonna notice, we do have some very structural underlay. That is a manual fill underlay that goes under the entire piece, very much like you do for a patch attachment. This vertical fill runs from the center out. How did I make this? We had two different pieces, two semicircles that I digitized manually. So it runs from the center out, goes down to the bottom, runs from the center out. What does that do? It smooths down the cap. It attaches the cap crown uh, to the, to the uh, stabilizer when we're doing caps. On a, a shirt, what does it do? If we have material that is loose, you'll usually see this done in patch attachments on caps. But when a shirt material is loose and very wrinkly, this can smooth out that material and attach it down and keep it flat before we start running the rest of the design. So like I said, this had, this moved from an original jacket piece uh, to a piece that was done on other lighter materials and sports shirts. And so it had some issues with that stuff. So we added that out to the fact. Then we have our central white. And I don't add more underlay because it's already enough underlay. We have a different direction. We're going horizontal. So we're 90 degrees off. No problem. I've got some feathers that are there. They're in the white. Now we're going to do a couple of detail pieces and then the fill that makes up the entirety of that outer ring. And here is where the travel comes in. Satin stitch, but wait, what did I do? Uh, I jumped underneath the eventual travel area. What is it? It's the satin stitch highway. If you've got a satin stitch that's a border or is later on in your design, it is a beautiful place to hide some straight stitches. So what did I do? Went around the circle, going outside from each one, tracking down to the bottom for my start point, and they're all connected on the outside. So there's my little set of, of points all the way out to the outside edge. The thing is, I know between the fact that I'm covering that um, with a satin stitch on the outside edge and that I have a, a straight stitch black outline on all these pieces, that it's not going to show. As long as I've got sufficient pull compensation on that outer ring, the chances are you're not going to see it. And so what ends up happening later, we, have, uh, we start doing all the detail work. So here's all the detail work in the center in the black. Now, looking at this again, I would have done the, the bird, but I wanted the bird's feathers to be on top of that edge. When I look at it now, it really wouldn't have mattered that much. But, you know, then we do the, the individual feathers on the bird's wings, the upper feathers as a, a little rough satin, and then the leading edge of the wing. Then the tail feathers are just outlined on those white feathers. You see the white satins are already underneath there. Detail work in the middle. And like I said, all one connected stitch. There's no jumps in that black. And then there's the lead edge on the wing and then we do this final border inside and magically the satin stitch highway under which we travel comes along to cover up all my little sins <laughs> with a nice underlay to help cover it up there it covers up all my travel and then we do a little bit of detail work on the bird so that's what it is all that travel is done why not because i couldn't connect them i could have connected them at the bottom however because i was seeing some warping i used the tablecloth method to move from the center to the outside edge and it actually was a much more stable piece right? Um, is that what you're going to do with everything? Heck no. I wouldn't do that all the time. Uh, at the same time, it is something that's useful to look at as if you're having a problem and you can physically see why it's happening, all my stitches are running toward the middle. And so the center of this design is trying to pop out on me. It's trying to push forward. And you can think about it. If you were taking a piece of loose fabric, just imagine for a moment, piece of loose fabric, you grab it on both sides, you start smoothing it toward the middle, you're pushing it and pushing it. What's going to happen? In the middle, the loose fabric is going to want to pop up. It's going to make a dome. 
Well, the same thing happens. You're running all these satin stitches from the, from the edges out toward the center, toward the center, toward the center, toward the center. What's going to happen in the middle? It's going to want to push together. It's going to draw that up and it's going to make a, a little popped out button in the middle. What can we do? Hey, go away from the center toward the outside edges where that material has a place to go, where that tension has a place to leave. Could I have made this a little less dense? Absolutely. I, I would revise every design I've ever done probably. Um, but little less dense would help. Certainly the direction of travel helped too. After I did that, all the outlines started hitting just fine and we didn't have the pop out button effect. So, you know, we don't want to have that weird pop out button. We just make sure we do it in the right, just the right order, right? And I'm going to go ahead and show you a piece that I've showed you guys before in another context. And because it looks so weird in the preview, I'll actually probably show you the images again first. Uh, but let's go ahead and bring this back up one more time. Talking about travel, before we get into a little bit about applique and finish off for the day, uh, we have this piece here. This is our, our friend of the pixel slime. Here's what his original art looked like, the kind of 8-bit Nintendo style art uh, of that time. And we look at our final little guy here. Here's our pixel slime with our 90 degree angle rotated pixels that we get that cool kind of a pixelated version of the piece that has a little different shine and shadow that happens with satin stitches nat naturally. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of pull compensation had to be done to make that top and bottom edge look nice. And when we show you the design again, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But here's our little friend, the pixel slime. Here's how he turned out flat straight to you on camera. And then with a little bit of off angle, you can see that lovely textured shine that looks like a mosaic. You want to see more about that? There is a 3D, uh, not 3D, there is a pixel art tutorial kind of video I did just on that fella. But the other thing we can see is when we're running a little pixel slime, there's travel stitches. What do we do? We know that these pixels are going to run later in satin. So as I was going through this piece and I found out I had a place where I couldn't travel where I wanted to travel and have it look nice, well, then I just used some straight stitches on the outside edge and we travel to that next set of pixels that we need to knowing that it's going to be covered by a future color. Uh, satin stitches, because they're nice and long and lofty, are fantastic uh, places to hide travel. So why not do that? So while, while we've got our friend here, let's go ahead and do a slow replay. Um, we'll take off our art so we can just see our little friend, the pixel slime and nothing else for a second. And let's just replay them out and just watch the travel. It's not phenomenal travel or something that's crazy, but it just lets us see what's going on. Most of the time, Pixels are touching, no big deal. But when we have to go to another row and I'm not trying to track back and I'm making sure that I have things, uh, have kind of an over and under kind of motif that I'm looking to get, I want this texture to go correctly. Well, then I'm working in lines and I'm working out from the center so that I don't have kind of issues with my texture. You can also see where I'm leaving areas for future stuff. But instead of jumping and trimming, what do I do to get down to this other area where I have to make some other stitching happen where I've got my layers? Well, I'm centering out. Once again, I did this, I intended this for a hat. So I'm also centering out. Remember that I'm bottom up centering out. Travel lines back to the bottom. And all that is, switch to your straight stitch tool. This is not an automated thing. Switch to your straight stitch tool and travel where you need to go. There's an extreme travel here. And it actually, I can see where I've got a little sequencing issue there. I should have had that travel connect better. It jumps, which was not too big of a deal because it's a very small jump from the end of that travel to the next piece, but I should have lengthened that out. So you caught me. <laughs> I could have made that better. But we have the textures going the way we want to. We're trying to travel from the center out. Well, that's how we do it. We drop in our travel stitches. So anytime when we need to go to that next row, we're traveling. That's how we get center out, how we travel back to the center and then we work out from the center. It means that we just don't get to travel with automatic branching. We can't just grab a whole selection of these little pixels and branch them. We have to do some of that traveling manually. It means slight amounts of drawing, but if you're already digitizing a design, uh, that amount of drawing is probably not going to be the thing that breaks you, you know? Uh, now, there's a little bit of stuff where I worked up toward the middle at the end, but you know, once we've got so much of this piece put together, it worked just fine. And as you can see, extreme uh, pull and push compensation. Look at the bottom of that thing, just to kind of make that clear again, how physical this, this embroidery is. Look at how rough all those edges are, how stepped they look. Why? Because they're going to push toward the open ends of those satins and the edge of the satins are going to pull in. So what do we get at the end of all that? Well, we have our little friend here and we can see, yeah, no jaggedness on the bottom. Why? pull and push compensation. But you see the travel. The travel is all about getting where you need to go and doing so underneath the future layers of the design. Does it have the same job as underlay? Not really. It does not. Um, travel is there specifically just to make things more efficient and make them run in a nice way for us, but it doesn't necessarily have to be 
it doesn't have to not have a job. You could certainly use it for underlay, but generally it's not in the color of the top stitching and usually it's done specifically for sequencing issues. In this case, once again, even though this is run on, on a flat, this piece was made so that it would absolutely run on a dad hat. Unstructured hat would run with this piece. So little, little 3D slime guy, totally would run on a hat. It's made to run on a hat. And honestly, that's how you get that to happen. You travel, you think about the apparent motion of the design and you just run, and by the way, smaller stitches, because uh, the longer a stitch is, the more loft it has, the more it rides above the layer of the, of the garment. Uh, smaller stitches run tighter. Longer stitches tend to run a little looser or taller. So your traveling stitches, you generally want them to be small because those traveling stitches are going to uh, sink down. You don't want to stick up. But generally, if our satin stitch is going this direction, our travel stitch is going this direction, that is going to definitely hold that down. Satin stitches are like that highway. Like I said, I always consider the satin stitch to be the highway in which I'm going to do all my traveling. So yeah, believe me, if you think about it that way, future satin stitches, that's the tunnel you're going to travel into. Yeah, the satin stitch highway, the satin stitch tunnel, it will eventually come over and cover up that travel stitching. So it allows us to control what? Our sequence and direction of apparent movement. So we can smooth things out so we can attach the way that we need to. And if, if for no other reason, for efficiency's sake, we can travel where we need to without worrying too much about it. And I have another little old design of mine that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop up and show you guys in a second. I'll go ahead and get it queued up before we go. But yeah, I, it's something just to think about that it's really, it's fairly easy. It's not, it's like, like it's a huge deal to think about it. It's just about really um, taking the time to kind of consider where we're headed, what's there later on in the sequence, and make that part of our planning. You know, think about that eventual construction. So to show you some more of my commercial work, um, this is just a little piece. This is a, a little uh, Peterbilt truck with a loader in the back. So we got a rock hauler here, and we've got our little loader in the back that's loading it up. So this is a piece I did quite some time ago, but you'll get to see how it's put together anyway. I show you guys stuff that maybe is not the best method I've ever done, but it's realistic to what we did in the commercial world. So let's look at this piece. We'll put it together. First, you're going to see um, the insides of the wheels are little satin stitches, so they look nice. We've got a little bar of satin underneath that's connected. But look what's happening here. Travel. Where's that travel at? Well, eventually under the body of that uh, loader, but it's a fill. So what do you want to make really uh, sure of? That the travel travels at a different angle. We have this angle. The fill is horizontal. It's going over it. As long as we don't match is if the travel is in the same direction, let me go talk my hand some more. If the travel is in the same angle as the fill, there's a chance for that travel stitch to pop up. So we would see the travel stitching going through. If the fill is at this angle, that travel should be at some angle that is contrary to it because we're trying to cover it up. We don't want it to pop through. We don't want it to blend against uh, our better judgment here. We're trying not to get it to blend. So that little travel connects that together to that boom and the boom goes up to the top. Once again, we're traveling to get to the next area where we have white. So we've got areas at the back of the rock collar that are white. Uh, individual, you can also see individual stitches with different angles. So we have different angles on this fill. So we get some detail, we get some dimension, we get some uh, play of light out of that. So then we have travel that goes up to connect all these little satin stitch lights on the top to the bar, our fill. Then we have uh, satin stitch bar, travel underneath. We travel to the next satin stitch bar because that's supposed to be underneath the eventual fill that's here. There's the fill that makes up most of the body and a separate uh, panel for the door. Nice little curved fill to make up that fender. Then in the loader, we have a piece that's there that's covering up the edge of the loader. We're traveling along the wheel here. We go up to the top and this travel actually is partially covered later by straight stitches. If we have enough straight stitches right over the top, especially something that's got a nice contrast to it, sometimes we can even use um, a straight stitch line to cover it. And in the case of a darker orangey color like we have in the loader with a black outline that's run over it multiple times, that's not too bad. It didn't show up too bad. And honestly, I went ahead and went for it. I didn't break apart that orange, so we didn't have a trim. So we have a front tire made of two pieces. We got two different uh, opposite angled fills with a straight stitch travel between them because we're going to cover that eventually. We have that nice uh, satin stitch on the edge of the tire to make the tire sit up and be nice and dimensional. So we have that panel in the back. By the way, once again, just because we have a continuous area of color doesn't mean it is one block of stitching. I'm using multiple blocks of stitching throughout all that black that's connected. Why? Because the side of a tire is not the same texture as the inside of a fender wall. All right. So in this case, we have blacked out windows for that, which is fine. Means not drawing a driver. <laughs> 
and the windows are on top. Is that weird? Yup. Uh, I wouldn't do that these days. I would probably sacrifice and get another color break so that I could have those windows not have that edge on them like that. But it ran okay. I'm not going to complain too bad. Customer liked it. Uh, these days, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so we have also some detail lines, some shading that's done in the back. As we're putting together these pieces, we have that grid used to make the little mesh window for that piece. So that grid is done ahead of time. And then we have our piece that's coming up to the side of the loader, individual tires. And there's actually travel between them that goes right along and, and fills in. It fits into the fill by matching the same stitches on the edge of the fill. And we start doing some uh, detail work on the back connected by an outline. There's our hubcap with our lugs. There is our nice big front bumper, multiple pieces to make up the light stems. And then we get into the grill and the border of the grill, a nice satin stitch, give us some texture. Uh, window, window outlines, the nice chrome, uh, kind of chromal awning style set up on there, louver on the top. We have some detail lines, more chrome, big stacks, tanks, all connected. And then lastly, we do have some little black detail that's done around the outside edge that all travels together. It's one big piece. And you can also see that I'm doing the shading and using it to travel between the different uh, satin stitch elements that are on top of that fill. So is this a perfect piece? Other thing to look at, see how that travel stitch right there is being covered by the satin stitch on the shading in the loader and by the connection of the hydraulic ram lines. Travel, travel, travel. All right. So that's how that's put together. We travel underneath the elements that are going later. Is this a perfect design? No, I cringed showing you this, but it has some good examples. And like I said, not every piece you're going to do is a masterwork or follows all the same rules. And when I'm looking at this piece, um, the eventual design looked nice. It wasn't bad. Are there things I would do differently? Absolutely, I would. I saw some stuff in here that made me uh, scowl at myself. At the same time, um, the travel stitching is good. The way it's put together is good. It is massively minimized trimming. There are not trims in each of the colors on this piece. The only trimming happens when we go get up to the lettering or between the colors. There are no jumps in these colors because the colors were planned for both apparent motion and for efficiency. So that's what traveling's about. Not jumping, not trimming, not wasting time, and not having stitches pull out or having any issues during that uh, trim cycle. So like I said, that's what we're talking about. That's traveling and that's interesting. The other stuff to think about, uh, it's really about traveling between objects. And I'll show you a piece that I was working on, the piece of my own um, that is unreleased. So be kind, you know, it's a piece of my own art and drawing. I draw weird, creepy stuff sometimes. So you guys have seen skulls and weird stuff from me. Uh, this weird little reliquary looking piece. Uh, yes, creepy hand, I got it. There's a reason for it. I did it in an art, in an art uh, kind of ex exercise. But what I wanted to show you about it was that we have some traveling in this patch design um, that's interesting. Ignore the patch portion for the moment, just to kind of show you that there's this, this cycle you get into when you're doing uh, fine lines and satins in the same color, where you cycle between the fine lines and satins, and you often do fine line work first before the satins so that you can hide the travel between them. And then you can kind of use the satins as that highway. So what I'm going to do is just kind of uh, play back through this piece. Because once again, there are no trims in that black. That is one solid filament of black. Honestly, there's no trims in the design aside from between colors because we're done, we've done traveling well for it. So we'll go ahead and just do a real quick uh, replace scrub through this piece. We don't need to worry about um, the tacking necessarily. This is done uh, as a pre-cut, but it doesn't have the zigzag. It just has a straight stitch tack. Um, but let's go ahead and kind of move out a little bit. What you're going to see is after we do our textured fills here that we have a uh, detail work that is all connected and then it goes to a satin and then we do our detail work as a travel and then satin and we connect everything with little travel stitches at the closest point. And this is done for efficiency's sake, but luckily when we have something that has shading like this, most of the time we actually have places for it to go. But we, we transition between a straight stitch line and back, but you'll often see that though there's detail work in that straight stitch line, some of it's just travel. Um, we know that eventually we're going to have this thick line that goes over this little edge that's going to be under the uh, third finger in pinky. And because we know that that big line is going to be there, we can travel into the center of the design and then come back out on that satin stitch. So let's go, let's go ahead and zoom a little tighter on that piece again. We'll go back and scrub through it. You'll see that there's detail work being done, some shading work, and then the satin with uh, some underlay in it to give it some body. We travel into the middle on that detail work and then satin our way back in or back out of it 
back to our original location. So there's a lot of this just kind of trading back and forth. So there are times where travel will just be connected to detail that is supposed to be visible. I still consider that kind of planning your traveling. Even if you're doing manual shading, like you can see here, I have some dark shading that's under this finger that's done manually. Well, that was all done ahead of time with the knowledge, of course, that I'm going to put some satins in there for the thicker lines. And that's all part of that travel. But you can see that I'm planning things like um, the edge of my hand here is underneath this wrinkle, this fold. The edge of the finger is underneath the finger that's further. And that this finger that's behind the third finger, well, then the satin stitch is going to run underneath that satin that's on top of that in order to get the over under texture that I want. This also means sometimes in order to do things back backwards, if I'm moving in a direction that won't allow that, what you're also going to see is they will put, I will put these tabs. Do you see right there in the satin stitch? Look right here that I run a small tab of satin stitch and then travel out and do the rest of my satin stitch work and then connect back to the tab here and finish so that when this piece is done, and pardon me because I just moved something around, when the piece is finished, it looks like this line is further back than the knuckle of the finger that's supposed to be closer to us. So that's one of those things we do once again. Why are we traveling in this case? We're traveling and splitting up objects because we have a layering effect we want to achieve to make this folded finger that's supposed to be closer to us than the palm and closer to us than the other fingers uh, literally sit on top of the other fingers. So once again, what do we have to realize? Just because we have a connected area of color, it's not uh, the same shape. We draw multiple shapes to make any one object. Uh, any line may be made of several different uh, different objects in a construction. This this certainly has one nice big line here, but this line here is made up of three different objects. We have the initial tab that's up here that makes part of it. If we consider this part of the line, which I don't think it should be, um, the rest of these pieces that are here though, these columns are all broken up. We have multiple columns that are all making up this individual piece. So we have these individual little tabs that allow us to connect. And this little uh, junction here down here is a separate object altogether. But like I said, the traveling is just to get to the next place and allow us to explore sequence either for technical reasons or for artistic reasons because we have a certain kind of layering we're trying to achieve. So we'll just play through more of that. In fact, I'll, let me zoom out. I'll just scrub through that again so you can just kind of see how it's put together. You see some of the lines that are there because I haven't selected, but we can see how each individual piece is put together and how it's connected. The travel is thoughtful. It's done in a specific way in order to be both efficient and still allow the layering to be logical from the back to the front. And of course, then we have the other kinds of things we talked about as far as uh, stitches you don't see. We have this lovely edge that was the edge uh, tool from Stitch Artist 3, which is also the lovely uh, automated patch edge that you'll find in the Merrily program from Brilliance. But you can see how it's put together where um, I've actually split this into two segments. I have an initial placement stitch and a tacking stitch that's in this first section, but then I run all of my center material. And lastly, what you're going to see is a, a kind of um, both a body increasing and tacking round uh, followed by the full coverage motif like programmatic cover stitch that's done to be like a marrow stitch. And that's once again, a multiple piece process. Why do we have that edge reinforcement there, um, both to hold down fibers in the material and to provide extra body so you get that traditional very thick patch edge, as you might see from some patches that we have around. Um, it suffice it to say, that's another one of those things, that placement, the tack down, these are things that have jobs. So speaking of that briefly, like I said, in applique and in patches, it's very similar. We often do have a placement stitch. Placement stitches are just to show the area of where an eventual piece of material should be placed. Whether we are hand cutting an applique or placing a pre-cut piece, we draw just inside the edge of where the eventual applique material should be. And that gives us a, a placement stitch. And if we have a, a shape that is at all oblong or strange, like my weird little hand patch is, um, then we have an orientation where we can get it exactly where it's supposed to be. And then temporarily affix it so that we can do any tacking down. So tack down stitches are there to hold down uh, the design material, to hold down the app applied materials in the design area. And the other thing to remember is you don't have to use an applique tool or one shape to get things done. And so I wanted to show you another fairly old piece of mine, I believe, that I have here to show you. 
a provider. I actually have it loaded up. I was having some issues before we got on here, so I don't know if I've got it still. Um, if I don't, I'll have to, you'll have to forgive me because I thought I had it loaded up and I may not. Um, let me see if I can grab it. But we have some other applique pieces I want to show you that have a zigzag, but there is one very specifically that I had certainly hoped to show you if I can. And I will certainly give it, give it a, a shot to pull it up. But if you have multiple pieces of applique that are laying together nested, like a nested cut, multiple colors of applique, sometimes you use the same tacking or the same placement and they're run all at the same time instead of doing uh, an individual object, especially when we have areas of the applique that don't show. So I'm hopefully I can show you this stuff. I've got the actual piece, but I'm hoping I can actually bring you the the full design to give you some ideas of this. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, um, I did have some issues right before uh, going on today where I had a crash in my original file manager. But let's see if I can bring this up. I'm gonna go ahead and try and get it for you. Looks like I got it. So we've got our good piece from uh, Desert Dogs and I'll show you the original design first. I think I believe I've, I've got that as well in my uh, stack to show you to let you know what it looks like. So yeah, we got that. Let's bring that up. <laughs> Sometimes technical stuff happens right toward the end. All right, so this is Desert Dog Racing. This is one of my early, uh, racing. By the way, let me let me say that again the way it was written. Desert Dog Racing. Uh, this is a piece that I did very early. And honestly, one of my earliest applique pieces where I did any sort of um, multi-cut applique, almost all of this piece's applique, I will let you know the tongue, the teeth, the mouth, and the all the details in the, in the rest of this are stitched as well as the lettering. But these big areas of color are all big, flat, uh, twill applique. So this is big uh, plotter cut twill applique. You can see it here. So this is, and I'll just tell you, it's standard stalls, PS, poly, pressure sensitive poly twill applique cut on a roll fed cutter. So old school signed vinyl style cutter, cricket style cutter for folks who come from the craft side. That is the kind of cutter I use to do all this stuff. So drag knife cutting, uh, not laser. But this piece was done with multiple pieces together, and I just thought we would run through it. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you the design itself. Here is the Desert Dog Racing design, the original design. And I've just got the uh, stitch file here, so you're not going to see any objects, and you're going to see jumps and stuff that weren't in the final piece. But you can see how it's put together, right? The thing to note is because we're doing this ourselves manually, all the placement runs at once. Because I'm going to use a little bit of adhesive, and in the case of the PS Pro Poly 12, it has a pressure hence it, a sensitive adhesive. So it's like a sticker. You cut it and peel it off of the carrier sheet and you stick it down. So these are the three pieces of applique that were there. I did all the placement lines at once because I was going to place all the material before I started. Uh, in this case, I believe I'm using a zigzag tack on this piece. And what you can see is I uh, went and tacked the center first. Why? Uh, in this case, I want to hold both sides down of the material that's on either side of this line, but the head of the wolf, of the dog, <laughs> as it were, it looks more like a wolf to me, uh, has to be on top because I want that satin stitch border to be on top of this border. So do I have an object? Did I grab this object here, which I would have had in a cut line? This little object in the middle, did I grab that and just click applique on it? Absolutely not. I created a piece of applique styled uh, column, but the column only follows that outside edge because I can't just grab that SVG file, EPS file, whatever file you're using for your cut. Didn't make a lot of sense. In the case of this one, I did this manually and I used a double zig. I used a double zigzag instead of a single zigzag to do the tack because I wanted some dimension and I really wanted to hold on to both sides. So you'll see a double zigzag run for that. But let's go through the rest of the piece. Then I tacked down the, uh, the dog's head, <laughs> as you might expect. Tack down and covered. The cover covers the edges, so it makes sense. And then lastly, but not least, I went ahead and did a pretty heavy tack and cover on the outer edge. Uh, at no point did I use an automated uh, applique tool. Can you use one? Absolutely. And in fact, if you have a nice strong applique tool, um, you may have one that allows you to knock out areas. We have those in Imbrilliance where if we call something an applique, it'll knock out stitches that are underneath this piece if it's from an existing design. If you're making your own design though, if you're digitizing your own design, don't put in stitches that don't belong there. Go ahead and stop those elements. Um, each one of those borders is a piece. It's a border. The straight stitch that's used to create the uh, outlines for these shapes. Also, you can see um, it's not outlining each shape separately. The placement stitches are one object where they make sense and it doesn't like outline each thing three times. So we don't have a multiple of outlines here because I've converted from the vector. I drew one placement shape that made sense. So 
remember again, you don't have to use the automation where it doesn't make sense. And in fact, sometimes it makes absolute sense not to. Whereas on this outer edge, though I didn't use a, a, a manual tool to do it or an automatic tool to do it, the outer edge of this totally could have used a, a regular applique tool and applique setting because it really didn't have anything going on that required me to cut anything out or have anything special. But when we have two-sided applique like that, we might have multiple pieces that are coming together. Totally reasonable to decide. I'm going to draw some of that myself to make it more make more sense. And then, of course, traditional embroidery at the end. One of my early pieces, I think, is a little too dense in some areas. But we have a nice, uh, we have an underlay under there. Did it need that much fill underlay? Probably not. I didn't want to show through any of that silver gray. So I went ahead and covered it up, but I probably could have done with a little bit less. Then we have our individual satin stitch teeth that are done later. You see some travel between those that are eventually going to be hidden by the lip. We have nice little curved fills for the uh, eyes. Got our text centered out once again, kind of centered out. At least it starts in the center top and it kind of helps it to hold down, gets that side held down, but then it tracks around the rest of the direction. When we're dealing with a flat and a jacket hoop, not a big deal, especially in the days now of magnetic hoops. I wish I would have had them at this point. Uh, the old st standard green hoops did fine for this, but it's not like it's great to do a big piece in those. And then, of course, final details are done in another round of black. Could I have probably separated that out differently to make less color changes? Maybe. In the case of this piece, uh, I feel fine having tack done the full tack downs first. Um, but you'll see the rest of the details. Are there some jumps there? Yeah, there's places where I really can't travel. But I did try and make the best usage of uh, the design motion without doing any unnecessary jumps. The other thing you'll find, too, when I know I'm doing a manual trim, uh, which we didn't run a lot of trimmers at where I came from. We usually did a manual trim. I stopped and left a longer area between the two where I knew there'd be a manual trim in here. Instead of, of stopping at the closest point, I stopped at furthest point. Why did I do furthest point? Because I'm going to stick a trimmer under there. I thought ahead of time of what the next process in the sequence is. So that's another job right there, jumps. It's another like piece that doesn't show, but if you think ahead about what it physically is there to do, you can help yourself. If I'm gonna trim manually and not use the automated trimmers on the machine, yes, I need to make sure I'm locking in the case of these pieces with these really small ends of the satin stitches, not a huge problem, but we can also add, we've got a little manual lock that tacks back into these pieces, but we leave that longer trim between these pieces instead of trying to travel efficiently, why? so that my trimmers can fit underneath there and I don't have to uh, have the people in the trimming department spend a lot of time trying to dig the point of the trimmer down. And in fact, if they start trying to dig the point of the trimmer under a really tight trim, they're likely gonna mar the fabric or mar the design. So once again, unsung heroes here, we've got our placement and tack down stitches. The thing to remember, build, build it yourself. Realize that if you don't need to have an object there, even though we've pulled in a vector, believe me, do I have a vector that is, because I'm doing multiple cut files or multiple cuts, each one of these pieces as a single object here, the head as a single object and the ring as a single object? Absolutely I do, I have to. Because in order to cut them and nest them, I have to have all four of these objects. But when I brought it into the software, did I just grab each of those objects and click applicate convert on them? Absolutely not, because it doesn't make sense for the way it's layered. What makes sense is to build out the elements you need. Uh, truthfully, all I really had to build out on this one, these two strokes are built out individually because they don't need anything extra. They don't need the rest of the shape. But I could have absolutely and general, and kind of did. You can see from some of the kind of wild underlay here, this is one satin column object, and this is one satin column object, uh, which could have used an automatic uh, applique setting just fine. Um, is it my best piece ever? No. Did it look all right? I think it looked all right. People liked it. I still keep it around because I like it. And also because honestly, in, in the business I was doing, not too many people wanted to do a multicolor applique. And I thought, man, a nice big piece of multicolor applique really is kind of sharp, looks lovely. Uh, I do like the look of these kind of jersey style uh, large patches. Makes me think of hockey patches that we did for a while. Really do love it. I mean, of course, there's always room for small appliques. Um, this is a lovely small applique used to get very, very tiny text and detail on a Piquet polo shirt. I love a small patch style applique with a, a captured edge. Love that stuff. Looks nice. And as you say, that same sort of uh, tack down can be used. We can use zigzag tack downs and patches. And just because you have a patch tool like we do to create the patch edges for Merrily, it doesn't mean you can't decide to make your own tack downs, your own cut lines, your own placement lines, or um, split that patch edge. If you're using Stitch Artist 3, 
you can make a multicolor patch edge with multiple elements just because it looks like a single element. Or even if it was um, one color, you could make multiple objects and have broken, quote unquote, patch elements. You can do that. You don't have to have one continuous border. You can make multiple borders that overlap. You have to think about what it is you're doing physically, certainly. But after that, once you know how it works, everything else is up to you. Everything else you want to do is up to you. Now, we've gone long, so I'm not going to go into all the other stuff about patch attachments and the stabilization. If we want to talk about that. It's already been talked about. I just think that we've probably covered the gamut here today. Uh, what is probably good to take away out of all of this, out of this discussion of constructive stitching? Well, number one, it's physical. Embroidery is physical. We are using thread. If you think of it like laying ropes down in your living room, it starts to make a lot more sense than when you're thinking about settings. Uh, settings and variables are not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with physical thread, needles that are going through materials, uh, materials that stretch under compression. They stretch under tension. They wrinkle under compression. They buckle. They move. So constructive stitching is useful. Why? Because it helps us to mitigate these problems and because we can build. We build our layers, underlay, top stitching on top, other stitching on top of that stitching, and we know that the way the stacking ropes would be is how they're gonna work. All stacked together, maybe they fall together. Stacked in opposite directions, this the bottom portion is going to hold up the top. We get loft, we get color coverage, we get edge refinement, we get the ability to uh, solidify the items together. Remember, when we are stitching, we have layers of stabilizer that's dimensionally stable, fabric that is almost always is not, and then we're dealing with connecting those together. Underlay can help that. And then traveling. Think about the sequence of your design and where you need to go next. Understand in the sequence from first stitch to last stitch that we have opportunities to travel under other places that we will stitch eventually and that allows us to stay connected. And it's not a waste of thread because believe me, you're wasting more time and just as much thread trimming just about every time. Uh, certainly it's much more likely to have problems, thread breaks and uh, thread coming loose. But whenever you do this, whatever reason you're thinking about it, for efficiency's sake, for centering out for caps, for tablecloth method, trying to stretch out some material, smooth material that's causing issues, think physically about how stitches work, think about how thread works, and plan ahead. Think ahead, look beyond, and you'll be able to make that stitching that we don't see do the job you want it to do. All right, so let's grab the last couple comments as people are coming in. Uh, just something to think about. You got to really have some concepts in your head, but I, I love that you guys came along with me on this journey, so thank you for being here. Last couple comments, we have great visual with the tablecloth. Thank you, Lisa. I, I like that one. Honestly, the apparent motion of the needle is something we don't think about enough. People tell you pathing, they talk about it, but mostly it's about efficiency of movement. They don't think about us shifting the literal fibers of the material, which obviously we're going to do. The needle is puncturing, the stitches are under tension, we're adding more stitches, we're packing them between fibers in the garment. We're shifting the physical material and you had to think about it always. Um, Jesse came in and said, hi, hi, Jesse. Thank you for being on and always watching those replays and leaving me a comment. Love that. That's always nice. It's the air we breathe, you know? Uh, Lisa says, again, starting with a single needle, didn't trim and only a four by four hoop. First time I saw travel stitches and then uh, explained was a big light bulb moment. So many rely on thread cutters and accept the snot mess they make on the bag side. Yeah, um, I don't trim unless I have to. And in fact, what I'm going to tell you, I have one other thing I'm going to share very briefly just because it's something I've got queued up and it's worthwhile to put up here. Um, between letters, for me, my length that I, I won't accept is over two millimeters, but under two mils, a lot of the times I'm leaving letters connected unless it really just looks poor. And in fact, one thing I will tell you, you can do, it's not something that's automated, but remember, we don't have to let everything be an automated jump. Where a letter ends and the next letter starts, if we break those up or use multiple lettering objects, or if you're digitizing your own text, you're building this out of satin stitch blocks, you can nest a connector. So what does this mean? When we have a little sub, like it's at 1.4 millimeters, it's a real small connector between these two, this M and this R that are here, right? This little connector, uh, when we go into this connector, I believe I can zoom in, even though I'm looking at a slide, I'll zoom in on this image anyway, even though it'll be a little bit rough. What you're seeing here is rather than just let it jump over, 
I used my manual stitch tool or my straight stitch tool and said, click, 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 three dots. Going from this side to the other, what, what I'm doing is I'm putting one sub-millimeter stitch right between the lettering. If the garment has any thickness or loft to it, you can sink the connector and it's less visible, especially if there's some texture or some fuzz. Now, super high contrast color combinations, is it going to be perfect? No. Um, what you are going to see, though, is that we have that little sunken connector. It will not be as visible as a connector that is not done this way. Not everybody loves them. I know not everybody loves connected letters. Some people want to trim every one. What I'm going to tell you if you're trimming every one, uh, if you're in a font that supports it, turn off closest point connections so that it has longer connectors and you can trim them out yourself or you can uh, set them up. Some people set up every letter as a different color. If your machine has issues with trimming codes and stuff, you can do that. Um, I generally won't do that. Now, honestly, like I said, sub two millimeter jump, I will think about leaving that in 1.4. Heck yeah. I'm probably leaving that in one millimeter. Not a question. Plus you can do 0.4 millimeter stitches. As long as you don't do a ton of them all together, this is fine. You can have a sub one millimeter jump right there. And you really want to sink that connector, drop one needle point in the middle. Usually it's all right. and won't cause thread breakage unless you're on top of a structure that's nasty or have a ton of density built up right there. Um, so yeah, uh, sinking the connector for me is something I do all the time if I'm really concerned about it. Most times though, I'll be honest with you, if we're really under that two millimeter limit and it doesn't look too bad, I'm gonna leave that connector there because in a commercial world, we're just not trimming between every letter. And we're definitely not having the knots from tie-offs and all that uh, schmoo that's on the back <laughs> of the uh, letter, as you say, all the, she says the snot mess, the, the knots, the tails, all that mess. Uh, Sunrise says, Scott, uh, I love the different angles of fill to give it depth. Absolutely. I love the play of light. Uh, even if you just do it really simply, let's say you have a design where just a couple places you break it apart. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic stuff. Any play of that light. What makes embroidery what it is, is what thread is. Thread has light reflection. It has the ability to use its sheen and structure. That physicality also gives us the ability to see light play off the surfaces. And that makes thread appealing in a way that print just usually isn't. There are dimensional prints, there's other stuff, and I'm not I'm not kind of trying to, uh, you know, yuck your yum if you love printing. It's not a problem. I love printing too, but embroidery's strength is in its dimension and the dimension of the thread. Uh, Marta says, thank you for sharing the, edum the ed edumacation. Wow, Simpsons moment. Um, so much educational information. I'm happy to share it always. And Jordan says, excellent show. Got a march uh, marked to watch again. Love it. Thank you. And thanks, Frank, for being here. And thank you all for being here. Uh, turned out to be a long episode, not a short one. But man, sometimes you get into the meat of this stuff and realize how much power you get over your embroidery and your finished result if you really stop to think about the elements that go into it. All right, folks. Well, go play with some embroidery. Make some cool stuff. Hey, if you haven't seen it, because this is another fun thing, I'll, I'll bring up one last fun thing uh, for everybody to think about. So if you are out there looking for something fun to do for the heck of it, uh, come see my dad joke that I made in real life uh, over on the Embrilliance website, embrilliance.com. You'll find it on the front page right now. I made the round to it. If you've never heard this joke, this is something that was in my family. Uh, you're, somebody would tell you to go do a chore and you say, yep, I'll have that done whenever I can get around to it. And then they would hand you a little wooden disc or a coin that had the magical word to it on it. They said, now you get around to it. You can get to, to it right now. <laughs> so I decided for Father's Day here in the U.S. and for anyone who is a jokester and wants to have their own round to it to put out a little patch. So check that out on the Embrilliance website right now. You can get a free interactive design that lets you make the patch with fabric or if you want to sew it thread only in a very kind of freestanding style like I did with my example that's on the website now. Um, you too can be the jokester of your party <laughs> and ask somebody to do something for you and give them the round to it to make sure they do it immediately. <laughs> so guys, go have fun. And uh, if there's something you've been meaning to do, you know, get around to it. Have a good weekend. And I can't wait to do it again next week.